Hey there, this is MathCamp321 presenting a lesson on the fundamental theorem of calculus. And what the fundamental theorem of calculus essentially is, is a mathematical way of evaluating a definite integral. Now in a prior lesson, I made the connection that a definite integral is a way of representing the area under a curve of a certain function f on a specified interval. And what this fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to do is to figure out what that area is pretty easily. What we're going to do to evaluate a definite integral is we're going to find the antiderivative. And once we find that antiderivative, we're going to substitute in twice. The first thing that we're going to substitute in is the upper limit of integration b. And then we're going to substitute in the lower limit of integration a and then we're going to subtract the results of the two and that's going to give us the evaluation of this thing called a definite integral. And I think the best way to understand the fundamental theorem of calculus is to look at a couple of examples. So let's do that now. The directions are to evaluate each definite integral. So in number one we're asked to evaluate the definite integral of the expression x squared minus 3 from 1 to 2. So I'm going to start by finding the antiderivative. So I'm going to leave some space and I'm going to write down an x and the power of 2 when taking an antiderivative will, will move to a 3 and then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal which will be 1 third. Now I'm going to take the antiderivative of 3. Now when you take the antiderivative of a constant you're just going to tack on whatever the variable is that you're using. Now in this case we're using an x so I'm just going to say minus 3x. Since this is a multi-termed expression, I'm going to partition the whole thing off using parentheses. And I'm going to introduce a new notation, this bar here, off to the right. And at the bottom of the bar, I'm going to put a 1. And at the top of the bar, I'm going to put a 2. And that's to reflect these limits of integration right here. So my next step is going to be to substitute 2 into this expression and then substitute 1 into this expression and then find the difference between them both. So I'm going to start by substituting in 2. When I do that, I get 1 third of 2 cubed minus 3 times 2. Now I'm going to substitute in 1. And when I do that, I get 1 third of 1 cubed minus 3 times 1. So now let's clean this up. We end up getting 8 thirds minus 6 minus 1 third plus 3. Now I just want to caution you that because there's a negative here and this is multi-termed, we have to think about distributing that negative through each of the terms. And that's why we ended up with a plus 3 at the end here. Now cleaning this up a little bit further, we end up getting 8 thirds minus 1 third, which is 7 thirds. And we have negative 6 plus 3, which is minus 3. Now if I want, I can think of that minus 3 as minus 9 thirds. And when I'm finally done, I get an overall answer of negative 2 thirds. So evaluating a definite integral by hand it's not that difficult, but it is rather intense with the arithmetic. You've got to be pretty careful with your arithmetic and, and not really skip too many steps or you're bound to make a careless error. So write out each step and do all that arithmetic at a fairly slow pace. Let's take a look at another example. We need to evaluate the definite integral of secant squared x from 0 to pi over 4. I'm going to start by finding the antiderivative of secant squared x. And that happens to be tan x. So I'm not going to put plus c because plus c is reserved for indefinite integrals. And this one has a definite beginning and a definite ending, so I'm not going to put plus c. But I am going to use this bar here and put a 0 on the bottom and pi over 4 on top. And I'm first going to plug in pi over 4, and then I'm going to plug in 0, and then find the difference. So of course, to be able to do this successfully, you have to be pretty good with your unit circle. Now it just so happens that the tangent of pi over 4 is 1 and the tangent of 0 is 0 and the difference between 1 and 0 is going to be 1. So the answer and the evaluation of the second definite integral is 1. So in summary, before moving to the next slide, the fundamental theorem of calculus is a way of evaluating a definite integral. You're first going to find the antiderivative then you're going to substitute in the upper limit, then you're going to substitute in the lower limit, and find the difference between these two results. Okay, let's move to slide two. 
Okay, so in number five, we're asked to evaluate a definite integral of the expression root two over x from one to eight. So before I can take the antiderivative, I've got to make this more calculus friendly. And I think I'm going to start by rewriting two over x as two x to the negative one. Now, taking the square root of something is like raising to the one half power. So I've got these two elements, two and x to the negative one, both feeling the effects of this power of one half. So this may seem a bit odd, but what I'm going to do is allow each of those factors, the two and the x to the negative one, both of those things to feel the effect of the power of one half, but I'm not gonna write two to the one half as two to the one half. I'm gonna write it as root two, but I am gonna write the other factor as x to the negative one half. So I've got this weird blend of fractional exponents and radicals, but this is just how I choose to do it. And let's not forget that this goes from one to eight. Now I think I'm ready to take the antiderivative, and I think I'm gonna come down here and do that. So I'm gonna have a root two, which is just a constant. I'm gonna leave some space and I'm gonna write an x. The power of negative one half is going to raise to the power of positive one half. And then the reciprocal of that is going to be two. And I don't need a plus c because this is a definite integral. So I'm going to go ahead and use this new notation, this bar, and I'm gonna put one at the bottom and eight at the top. And I'm gonna start by plugging in eight. So I'm gonna have two root two times the square root of eight, which is actually another two root two. And then I'm gonna subtract from that two root two times the square root of one, which is just one. So basically what I have is eight minus two root two. And you can't simplify that any further. I guess you could factor out a two, but we're not gonna do that. So this is the answer to this definite integral. And once we took the antiderivative, the problem wasn't so difficult, but the transition getting from from the first step to the second step to the third step, those, those are the tricky things. There was a lot of weird uh, algebra that was required to get us to that point. But once we got here, it wasn't so bad. So some of these aren't too difficult, but you do have to have your algebra skills in check before you go on. So this is our third example of evaluating a definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's move on to the third slide. In problem number seven, we're asked to evaluate the definite integral involving an absolute value. And there's actually no rule for integration involving absolute value. So what we're going to need to do is split this up into two separate functions for which we can take the integral of. So there's gonna be two parts to this. And the first part is going to be this little triangular region down here, which I'm gonna call Roman numeral one. And the second part is gonna be this triangular region here, which I'm gonna call Roman numeral two. So basically, there's a few things that I wanna say here, that finding a definite integral of a function is like finding the area under the curve. And I've drawn that out for you here by giving you this sketch. But to actually do the evaluation, I'm gonna to have to think of this as two functions. So this absolute value looks like a V, and the V is made up of two arms. The first arm is a line, and the equation of that line is going to be negative 2x plus 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the definite integral for that little portion right there, that blue line, and this is going to be negative 2x plus 1 dx. And this little triangular region starts at 0, but I have to figure out where it actually ends. So I've got to figure out what is the x-intercept of this line. And that's actually a pretty quick calculation. If I let y equal zero and I move the one over, I'm gonna get an x-intercept of positive one-half. So this little triangular region starts at zero and it ends at one-half. And it's the function that defines it is this line y equals negative two x plus one. So we can even go ahead and do that evaluation right now. So I'm gonna write down negative two. I'm gonna leave some space, write an x, raise the power, which was one, to a two, and multiply by the reciprocal of that, which will be one half. And then if you're taking the antiderivative of a constant, you're just going to tack on whatever variable it is that we're using, which in this case is x. Now cleaning this up a little bit, this turns into negative x squared plus x, 
Because it's a multi-termed expression, I'm going to offset it with parentheses, and I'm going to use the new notation, and I'm going to put a zero here and a one-half here. And this turns out to be, uh, let's see, negative one-quarter plus one-half, when I plug in the top number, or the upper limit of integration, and then I'm going to subtract from that, plugging in zero. Now when I plug zero into this, I'm going to get really nothing at all. So that's, that's done, that's easy. So what I really have here is negative one-fourth plus two-fourths, which is one-fourth. So that first portion is one-fourth. Or I can think of it as the area under the curve is one-fourth in this Roman numeral number one. Now, let's go on to the other part. Now, this other part here, this other triangular region, starts at one-half, it ends at two, but this time the line is a little bit different. This time the line is going to be y equals 2x minus 1. So let's set up another definite integral, and then we'll add the results together for the net, the net area of both of those regions. So this is going to go from one-half to two, and this time the line is 2x minus 1. And now let's get ready to integrate. I'm going to write down the constant 2. I'm going to leave some space. The power of 1 rises to a 2. And the reciprocal of that is going to be 1 half. And then it's going to be minus x. Now cleaning this up, we're going to get x squared minus x. It's a multi-termed expression, so I'll use grouping symbols. And I'll introduce our new notation with a 1 half on the bottom and a 2 on the top. And you always plug the top number in first. So we're going to get 2 squared minus 2, then minus. And then we're going to have 1 half squared, which is 1 fourth, minus 1 half. So cleaning this up, we're going to get 2 squared, or 4 minus 2, which is 2. And then minus 1 fourth. And then distributing this negative through, it's going to be plus 1 half. But I'm going to call this plus 2 fourths. So we're going to get 2 plus one-fourth, which is really two and a fourth or nine-fourths. So Roman numeral one had an area of one-fourth. Roman numeral two had an area of nine-fourths. And if we add those together, we're going to get a sum of ten-fourths, which reduces, of course, to five-halves. So in this problem, I showed you that it's not possible to find the antiderivative of an absolute value function unless you break it into two separate functions. Think of it like a piecewise function with, in this case, two different pieces, a uh, negatively sloped line and a positively sloped line. And then we just added the two results together. Okay, let's move on to slide four.